Nationally, we're facing a real problem with housing affordability and discrimination. Homeownership is a wealth building opportunity, but the homeownership gap between whites and minorities hasn't improved in decades. One solution to look at is the use of artificial intelligence to help eliminate unconscious bias and promote equitable housing. But AI technology has its own limits, and when poorly designed, the results can be alarming. Meredith Broussard, an artificial intelligence researcher at New York University, wrote a book on exactly that called Artificial Unintelligence. We invited her on the show to discuss what we can do with artificial intelligence and how we need to make better choices about when and how we use it. Listen up. Let's start at the very beginning with the easiest question we'll ask today. Help uh, my listeners understand what artificial intelligence really is. Well, Emily, thank you so much for having me today. It is very exciting to be talking about this uh, to be having this conversation and be talking about this really important issue of AI uh, and how it impacts realtors and the real estate industry. So what is artificial intelligence? This is something that is the source of a lot of confusion. So if you feel like, all right, I use the term AI, but I don't really understand what it means, rest assured you are not alone. Mm. Right, we talk yeah. about AI, but very few, uh, very few people are really engaging with it. It's something that we use without thinking too much about it. So the easiest way to think about it is that artificial intelligence is math. Uh, the name suggests otherwise. Uh, the name makes it sound like there's a little brain inside the computer and the computer is really thinking, but that is not at all true. That is just something we've picked up from Hollywood. So if you think about AI and you think about Hollywood things like Star Trek and Star Wars and the Terminator and uh, HAL from 2001, A Space Odyssey, yeah. totally normal, but totally imaginary. So real AI is just math. And that's what we call narrow AI. And Hollywood AI is what we call general AI. And that is the stuff about the robots taking over the world and the robot uprising and the robot that is going to totally replace your job, et cetera, et cetera. It's very fun to talk about, but not at all remotely true. All right. So, so basic AI is not how taking over, but there is some degree of sort of takeover that's perceived with AI. I want to talk a little bit about that with regards to our industry. We're working hard to strive towards maintaining fair housing practices across the industry. And it's been said that there are opportunities for us to leverage technology in better ways and specifically artificial intelligence so that we could sort of curtail the natural bias that we all hold. But your book says that there's bias built into the AI also. So how do we split the difference between the natural bias that we bring as humans and the bias that the computers bring with the math that they're perpetuating? I'm so glad you asked that because the real estate industry in particular is very, very susceptible to uh, making bad decisions with AI and those bad decisions can be illegal. Right, so if you're using AI, for example, to decide between two potential tenants, don't do it, right? It is probably going to get you into trouble down the road. So think about AI as discriminating by default. For a long time, we thought that computers were more objective or more unbiased than people. And Unfortunately, it's simply not true. Computers are good at math, they're good at calculating, but that's it. That's what they're good at, they're machines. And the idea that a computer is more objective or more unbiased is a kind of bias that I call techno chauvinism, right? It's the idea that technology is superior. So what you should think about is you should think about what is the right tool for the task. Sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer and sometimes the right tool for the task is a human being and one is not better than the other. So AI in uh, image manipulation and image recognition in real estate is fantastic. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of interesting things you can do digitally with uh, digital staging 
or uh, you know that thing where you can use uh, you can use a drone to kind of map out the whole house and do the photos and turn them into a floor plan. Yeah. Uh, that is probably using AI, and that's a really great use of AI. You know, having an automatically generated floor plan, terrific, right? It helps you to uh, you know it helps you to enhance your listing. It helps potential buyers to understand the footprint of the property better. It's fantastic. But if you're going to use a computer to make a social decision, like who gets a loan or who should be a tenant, don't do it, run screaming in the opposite direction. So fair to say that it's it can be good to use AI to evaluate the built environment, but not a good idea to use it when it comes to the people. Give us some examples of where that's gone very wrong. You're telling them not to use it on tenant screenings, but what other examples can you give me of, of where AI has had such bias that it's clear that it was not a good idea? So the classic example is a uh, an investigation that was first done by Julia Angwin, uh, formerly at ProPublica. Uh, she now runs The Markup, which is an investigative journalism outlet. And this investigation was called Machine Bias. In it, Julia Angwin looked into the case of a recidivism algorithm that was being used by judges to evaluate whether or not people who are arrested would reoffend. After, uh, after the current arrest. And it turns out that judges were using this algorithm to generate a risk score, a risk of reoffending, and they were using that to factor into uh, bail and sentencing decisions. Well, it turns out that this algorithm was biased against black people. It favored white people and it was biased against black people. And mathematically, there was no way to make this algorithm more fair, right? So people are, people were really invested in the idea that this algorithm was more fair, that it was going to be better than a judge. But the problem is that there was bias baked into the very DNA of the algorithm. So the algorithm was trained on data about the real world. And what it did was it reproduced the conditions in the real world. This is how all machine learning algorithms work. Uh, what we do is we take a whole bunch of data, uh, historical data, and we feed it into the computer and we say, all right, make what's called a model based on this data. And the model will then predict a certain value. So people were using it to predict who was going to uh, you know, reoffend, who was going to commit another crime. Well, when we look at the real world, the problems are immediately apparent. Uh, we have had decades of over-policing of black neighborhoods, of poor neighborhoods. And what the model was doing was it was reflecting what it saw in the data, right? It saw that more black people were being arrested. Not that more black people were committing crimes because especially with drug crimes, uh, black people and white people uh, you know, use drugs at the same rate, commit drug offenses at the same rate, but there's a big difference in policing and who gets arrested and who gets sentenced, right? So when we take this over into real estate, uh, we can think about what are the problems that we know that exist in the real estate market. And the big one, I think, is residential segregation, right? So if we were to use existing data to decide who gets a home loan or who is, uh, you know, who is appropriate to live in a particular neighborhood, and we fed the data into the computer and told the computer that this is the way that we want, uh, want things to look, we would just be reproducing patterns of residential segregation. Yeah, and nobody so wants it, that. Yeah, so no, nobody wants that. That's correct. And those are the things that we're trying to tackle. But as you're saying this, I'm thinking the math is the math, right? But what has to change are the factors that are impacting the formulas. Because if the factors are weighted, then you're immediately perpetuating the same bias over and over again because the math is the math. So exactly. how, do, how do we build smart technology that allows us to 
to have an awareness of when the factors need to be weighted differently or what what environmental factors would be better to include in the formula as opposed to those that have that inherent bias baked into them. How do we build better technology so that we get the efficiency, but we overcome the math reflecting the bias that exists in these systemic issues? Well, there's a saying called garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Right. And so if we're feeding these systems with biased data, then that's what they're going to output. And I mean, that's how they work. It's a machine and there isn't really a way to do it differently. Yeah, uh, but the humans is, are biased too, right? I mean, the humans are biased. It's garbage in, garbage in, garbage out with the machine as well. But there has to be a way to split the difference in meaning in the middle so that the data that the machines are manipulating is, is uh, diluted, is changed, is altered in such a way that it overcomes that baked in bias, right? Well, I think this is why I, I like to use the frame of what is the right tool for the task, right? So we're not ever going to get to some kind of digital utopia where every single listing is online in exactly the same way. And then every single person puts in their data in exactly the same manner. And we can make some kind of fair and objective decision between individuals. Because decisions around real estate and around finances are actually social decisions. Right, so we run into a lot of problems when we use technology, when we use math to make social decisions. So we need to dial it back and say, okay, is this a mathematical decision or is this a social decision? And if it is a social decision, then let's be cautious about the degree to which we use math in order to not replicate centuries of uh, historical inequalities. Is there a way to hybrid that though? Is there a way that we can leverage the value of the efficiency of the math, but with some human oversight? You know, we've heard of technology where there are boards of, um, uh, there are ethics boards, for instance, that might oversee the ways in which the math is perpetuating bias or perpetuating areas of concern. Is, can we do both? Well, this is a good question. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It depends on the context. Uh, just putting an ethics board in place doesn't actually do anything. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't just hire a bunch of people and not empower them to make any changes and, and just kind of use it as window dressing. Yeah. You know, we'll use the term ethics washing, uh, which I think is a terrible term, but uh, it, it gives you the sense that, yeah, there are ethics boards that are just a front so that, uh, so that companies look like they're doing the right thing and then they're actually doing the wrong thing in the background. Uh, so I would say that uh, one thing that people can think about is when you as a realtor or as somebody in the real estate industry are evaluating software, uh, you should think about what are the social decisions that are being made by this software? What are the social decisions that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to kind of use the computer as an intervention? And is it appropriate to use that? And is this vendor somebody who is going and proactively looking at what are the ethical issues inside their software because most people are not. I mean, there are a couple of vendors out there who are and bless them. And uh, that is great. That is a step in the right direction. Uh, but you are opening yourself up to legal liability. Like you are responsible for the decisions made by the software supplied by your vendors. So you really need to know what's going on under the hood and if there's something that opens you up to legal liability, I wouldn't use it.
Yeah, no, I mean, you're really speaking to the power of people in positions where they belong, which for realtors is an especially strong and, and passionate um, perspective, given, given we believe that there's still a place that agents um, play a role in that direct person to person interaction as it relates to a real estate transaction. Technology plays a role also. Your call for agents and my members to be careful about the technology that they use because it has this um, potential uh, bias built in is an important one how you know it can be hard for for someone to understand that who is not a technologist what sorts of questions would you encourage them to ask or what what should they want to know as they're trying to safeguard themselves against using technology that might not be doing them any favors so i would say don't get in over your head um most people are familiar now with using electronic signatures Okay, great. Start small with something like electronic <laughs> yeah. signatures and then scale up from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, don't uh, don't try and I uh, kind of don't try and do all the technology at once. Make sure that you know what you're doing, that you have trusted advisors. Uh, we are also no longer in the kind of world where you can just hire uh, hire a kid to uh, to do your technology for you. Um, I mean, that definitely works when you're having problems with the social media on your phone. Like definitely right. <laughs> ask a kid to deal with the social media on your phone. But when it comes to uh, enterprise software that is going to uh, you know help manage uh, tenant issues or help screen right. tenants, really be very, very cautious and educate yourself and know what you're getting into. And you should know the legal liability better than your vendor. Yeah. And you're speaking to this um, frequently now with regards to rental tenant issues, property management. That makes a lot of sense to me because there are some real there's real discernment used in, in the ways in which you process the federal requirements as you place tenants in properties that you manage for other people. Um, something else that comes to mind for me is that agents are referring out their mortgage business, but should be aware of what processes, what technology their lender partners use so that they've also got awareness of where these same types of issues might occur with an external partner that they're referring out. It just pays to know, you know who your people are working with, what, how, what their process is, and understand their business enough that you can judge whether or not they're going to get you in hot water. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great, great summary. Great. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. We are in an insane housing market across the country, but especially in every major urban market, really um, just totally almost skewed data because it's such extreme circumstances, the way that the interest rates are, are right now, the, the demand that has been driven, the amount of cash people have socked away through the pandemic for those who are in a position to be able to do so. Um, I need to help my members think about data like a data journalist does and in the same way that a technologist might. What tips do you have for them with regards to how they deliver this extreme and sort of quickly moving data back to their consumer clients? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that it's important to be aware of the uh, lag inside the data systems. Uh, so for example, um, when, I, when a bank runs comps in a neighborhood, uh, the comps go back X number of years and with the insanity of the market right now, uh, what you know about the value of a property in a neighborhood might be out of sync with what the data says. Right? Yeah. So it's important to know uh, what the data is, uh, what the calculation is. Um, so is the bank looking at the past five years or are they looking at the uh, comparable values uh, over the past year um, and be able to negotiate uh, even when the data says something that is contrary to reality. Right? Yeah, so that's. Yeah, that's definitely consistent with the position that we're in in the market where, I mean, traditionally, we would never encourage a week over week look back, but as as high and volatile as the swings have been, I think you're having to contextualize the data in a different way than we have before. Mm -hmm. What else would you tell them? 
Uh, so know the data. I uh, also, um, I would say definitely integrate digital tools, but again, slowly. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I mean, people, people are looking online for properties, make sure that everything is filled out the right way. Uh, the system, the computer systems are pretty dumb. They're, uh, they're much dumber than you are. Right. So uh, instead of feeling intimidated by them, just understand them as, uh, you know, this is a set of forms. Uh, most uh, computer systems are just replicating paper forms. And you were great at the era of paper forms. So uh, the era of computer based forms is pretty much the same thing. It's just dressed up in this like unbelievably confusing and sometimes unnecessarily complicated interface. This has got right. a big shell around it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everything that's going on inside the computer is just reproducing existing bureaucracies. And that's a really good perspective that you can take from data journalists, right? So as data journalists, one of the things we do is we start with what was the paper process, right? Like back in the day, when you go to the post office to pick up forms, Right? Like you used to pick up tax forms at the post mm. office, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I barely remember anymore what, <laughs> what we used what to forms? do with the I know, post office. We've, yeah. we've blocked out those memories. But <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's what you did. And so every time you have a piece of paper uh, where you enter data into a form, well, that's been reproduced. Okay, well, let's think about what are the pieces of data? Where do they get registered inside the computer? And what are the calculations that happen based on the things that people put into those forms? Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I was gonna tell a story about kindergartners, actually. I would love that, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I know somebody who teaches kindergarten uh, and uh, he does this activity with his kindergartners where every Monday they go around and they count the pockets in the room, which I think is just the cutest thing because little kids love pockets. They think that pockets are like mysterious and amazing and you can put interesting stuff like wood chips and rocks into your pockets. And so then these, these two little kindergartners who are responsible for the Monday counting of the pockets and they have a clipboard and they make tally marks. And this is one of the ways that they learn to count, right? And on the uh, wall of the kindergarten, they have a big tally of you know how many pockets there were every Monday. So cutest thing you can possibly imagine. But I think about these little kindergarten pocket data collectors. And this is actually how all data gets collected in the world. It's people going around with clipboards or the electronic equivalent and counting things, right? So some days we're more accurate than the kindergartners and some days we're not. Yeah. <laughs> so keep this in mind when you're thinking yeah. about data. It's made by people, it's socially constructed, it's people writing things down. And so there are a lot of problems. So just be aware that there are problems be aware that there are problems uh, with what's going on inside the computer. There's discrimination. Just don't imagine that the computer or the data is more magic. Fair to say too that some some data metrics aren't quite as obvious as pockets as well. <laughs> some some hide their their stats a little deeper than that. But. Yes. <laughs> if only it were all quite as obvious as pockets. Right. Um, okay. Well, let's leave let's leave it here. Uh, you know, with, with the reckoning that I think our country's had overall and will continue to have with regards to how we change the systems that have led us to where we are today, especially as it relates to anti-racism, um, you know, what technology trends might, meet, might we see that would continue to evolve to meet our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals um, at, organizationally within our industry, but also just overall at large? I think that this is going to be uh, an individual effort and it's going to be a policy effort and a corporate effort. Uh, so I'm actually writing a new book about this, um, about how do we make anti-racist technology. I love it. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, so I don't have the answer totally worked out yet, but I will by the time the book yeah, is Yeah, keep finished. us posted on that. Yeah. Uh, I'll come back and report it. 
Uh, so you can think about technology as something made by people. And so you can think about the points at which we can intervene, right? So in the process of creating the software from scratch, uh, we can make software that deliberately does not uh, reproduce existing social inequality. Uh, we can make software that does not reproduce racist housing policy. Yeah. Uh, we can intervene at the point of the testing of the software. Uh, most people are not doing enough testing. Software testers, QA people are fantastic. They're very detail oriented and they are ready to do the testing. It's just that companies need to invest more in testing. Okay, so you can test for, is this software going to uh, privilege white people over black people? Is it going to uh, say that uh, disabled people are not uh, good tenants and able-bodied people are better tenants? Uh, you know, all the existing kinds of inequality, racism, uh, sexism, uh, ageism, all the isms, you mm -hmm. can look for those in the testing process. We can also uh, be more discerning consumers. So before you sign an enterprise software contract, ask your vendors to prove that they've done an audit for uh, algorithmic accountability purposes, right? Demand to see the data, demand to see the outcome and uh, you know, I'm sure we can do something at the level of contracts to make sure that, uh, that customers are not held liable. Uh, and then on the personal level, uh, we can choose not to use technology that is bad. Right? I'm really uh, heartened by something that's happening in the education uh, in the ed tech world, where there was software called Proctorio, uh, mm -hmm. which is a crazy name. And uh, it was software that was allegedly for remote proctoring of tests, but everybody hated it. Uh, it did not recognize people with dark skin. It was unnecessary mm -hmm. surveillance. Uh, it was terrible. And so many, many uh, colleges and universities are saying now, no, we're not going to use this software. Right, so that's that's a step in the right direction. We can say we're not going to use this technology that stinks. I know that during the pandemic, we are looking for absolutely anything that's going to deliver us from some of the pain of, you know, pandemic everything. Yeah, of doing this all day. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. Like I, I know you. we're all suffering. I know it's yeah. really tempting to say, okay, this technology is going to deliver me from this, but it's really not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Meredith, I appreciate that you are so focused on on identifying how human technology and data really is. It's it's that's a new twist, I think, on the way that we think about technology enabling our lives. And um, and I know that that our agents will value that. But given that there is a very human element to that, there's a very human element element to this podcast, too, in which we go through a rapid round of really just fun questions. You ready for them? Bring it on. Okay, uh, who's your favorite hero or shiro? Joy Bolamwini, who is the star of the new documentary Coded Bias. Uh, Joy is a, uh, a friend, a colleague. She is a pioneer in uh, getting people to understand that facial recognition technology is racist and should not be used. That's awesome. Uh, finish this sentence. The world needs more. Awareness that technology is not the highest and best solution. Oh, I love that. And what is your most needed work from home or quarantine item? A dog. <laughs> what kind of dog? Uh, I actually just got a new dog. He is a miniature poodle. Uh, and he is uh, just the brightest spot of quarantine for me. I love it. Same, same over here, a proud Frenchie owner. So, oh, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Well, Meredith, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Your insight is really helpful in understanding what we need to continue to do as we look for opportunities to um, you know, help, help do our part to correct things that have not been done correctly in the past. 
It was so great speaking with you. Thanks very much.